Okay. I wonder if you might start by um, telling us a little bit about what brought you to the village in the first place. Well, after I graduated from high school, I moved to an apartment in Grandview and uh, through some friends I met a lady who was leaving her apartment in Arlington and was looking at an apartment on Beck Street, as a matter of fact, and we decided to be roommates. It was kind of an interesting story because the apartments were just being built and the developer had given us a date when we could move in and he didn't make it so both of us had given notice at our apartments and he ended up putting us up at the Claremont Motel for about a week before our apartment was ready. Wow. But we finally moved in. It was across the street from uh, Beck Park and it's now been converted to condominiums. So it was really kind of fascinating to see my very first German Village apartment becoming a condominium. And then after that I moved to several different apartments as you tend to do when you're young and ended up in my house at the corner of Beck and Mohawk where I've been for 26 years. Okay, and so what, what were the things that attracted you to German Village? Well, it was pretty trendy then. Um, certainly not the village we know now, but there was, uh, it just seemed like a kind of an edgy place to live and I of course was a lot younger and it seemed to be the place to go. And as, as it's turned out, I found a home and I can't imagine living anywhere else. So remind me, what, what year approximately did you move down here? Well, it was about 40 years ago. Um, okay. So the math would be what? In the yeah, 70s? Yep. Yeah. yep. Um, and over the t 40 years, um, what kinds of changes have you seen within the village? Well, gosh. Um, most importantly, of course, the numbers of homes that have been restored. When I first told my folks I was moving to German Village, it was a little scary down here. There was still a lot of, uh, a lot of homes that hadn't been restored. Uh, a little, it was a little scary, but uh, I've always been a bit of a pioneer at, at heart, I suppose. And, and um, as it turned out, when the first year my house, or when my house was on house and garden tour, it was also in the Columbus Monthly Magazine, and it just so happened my folks came to visit from Texas. And as my dad was never one to uh, boast a lot about his children, but uh, when they got ready to leave to drive back to Dallas, last thing he said was, got an extra copy of that magazine. Huh. And my mother said he showed it to all of his cronies, that he was very, very proud. Oh, that's a great story. And I assume you still have that magazine. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. It's a little faded these days, yeah. but uh, I still have it. for props. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and it's, can you describe your house at the time when you bought it and how it might have changed over the years? Well, the same lady had lived there for almost 60 years. I'm sure when it was originally built, it was a one room. We've, we've looked at it and tried to figure out what was first and what was added. I actually have two addresses. I have a Mohawk address and a Backstreet address. Um, can I describe it? Yeah, the, um, the dining room was uh, flamingo pink. The kitchen, which is now my favorite room of the house, had nothing in it but a sink hanging on the wall. And it was yellow, if I recall. Uh, there were three tiny little bedrooms upstairs and an attic. Um, the three tiny bedrooms have become my bedroom and dressing room and bathroom. And we put a dormer over the attic, which made it into a little office that overlooks the kitchen. But I still have two living rooms um, and one bedroom, basically. So, of course, German Village is the only place you can comfortably sell a one-bedroom house. Okay. Um, so, I you know um, we're going to talk about some of your commitment to community, and I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about some things that first got you involved in German Village in the community when you came? Well, I joined German Village Society. Um, I always encourage my clients to do that now because you get a newsletter and you know what's going on and you know how to get involved. I have been involved in House and Garden Tour since I've been a member of the German Village Society. Um, I'm in the German Village Singers. I've had my houses on the tours. I've 
been on the board of trustees. Um, part of the, part of what makes a neighborhood viable, I think, is for people to get involved, and I always encourage my clients to get as involved as they choose to. And there's always something that uh, that people will find fits their time schedules and their their uh, uh, the things that they enjoy doing. So when you first moved here, you said you got involved as a member of the German mm -hmm. Society. And so how did you get your feet wet in all, in all that? Oh gosh, that's a long time ago. I'm not sure I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, volunteering. I always volunteered to be uh, a hostess for House and Garden Tour. I did that for many, many years. In fact, up until the time we started doing the, the pre-tour dinners on Saturday nights, which I also enjoy doing, I was a hostess, I think, almost every year. Um, so you had a lot of different volunteer opportunities, and you were mentioning being a volunteer as a hostess on the uh, for the pre-tours and sort of moves into talking, I mean, for the tour itself and uh, talk uh, moves into thinking about how you and Jerry Glick were the uh, first to um, be in charge of the pre-tour evening. Well, that of course was Fred's idea, Fred Holdridge. Um, Fred was always thinking and he was a great one for coming up with an idea and then passing it on to someone else to execute. And uh, he had seen this done, I think somewhere in the suburbs, maybe in Arlington, about some kind of a fundraiser, having dinners uh, before. So the first pre-tour was um, cocktails at Lindy's, and then limousine service to the various homes, and then back to Lindy's for dinner. And it went on that way for a number of years, I don't remember how many. But then Fred came up with another idea, and Jerry and I ran that one too. Um, and that was have the cocktail hour first, of course, and then see the homes, and then go to individual homes, not the homes that are on tour, but other people's homes for dinners. And that worked quite nicely for a good long time. And then we came up with various themes for the evening and so that's what we have now. Mm -hmm. So it's really evolved over it time. It has evolved. Uh, when uh, the cocktail parties w part would be at uh, Lindy's and then limos would take people around and then you'd end up back at Lindy's, about how many people were involved in those? It was The idea was to avoid the lines and in the beginning it was limited to 100 people. And you know, it was kind of she she to be on the uh, preview tour because you didn't have to stand in line to see the homes, and it was uh, it was well sold. It was all it was always sold out. Was there a rush like there is these days to <laughs> get the house that I, you want to? I I don't recall that it was quite like that. But of course, there the dinners were were always in the beginning. They were at at the restaurant, so. Uh, those wonderful theme dinners were not part of the the bidding process. So, in the, in the pre tour has evolved over time. Yes, it I has. Think, look at um, the pre tour schedule for 2013. It it has a mix of homes mm -hmm. and restaurants, and mm -hmm. so sort of going back to um, yeah. a combination yeah. of, of opportunities for mm -hmm. people to have dinner. Um, and I I don't know how many people are. On I don't know, days. but it's a lot, and it's a big, I understand it's a big portion of the budget. Mm -hmm. um, and so was it a money maker early on? With, um, um, it was a money maker, but I think it wasn't, at that point it wasn't counted on to be such a big part of the budget. Of course, we didn't have such a big budget then. Mm -hmm. And so how was it to get people to, to host dinners once you moved into that? It wasn't too difficult. Of course, we were all a whole bunch younger then. and. Uh, was it was fun to do. I've had dinners at my home. In fact, I'm doing one this year with Sandy Kite. Mm -hmm. How many dinners have you had over the years? Oh, there? golly. Um, I did, I think at my house I've done three or four. Um, I've done dinners with Sandy a couple of years, and uh, this one we're limiting to 12 people only, and we're doing the cooking. And so have you 
always done the cooking or not? Um, yes, I always have. I uh, I like the idea that that we're actually entertaining guests and not having it catered by someone else. Um, <coughs> so. Um, I'm not sure like the timing of things, but I know you've been a realtor for over 30 years. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that experience. Okay, uh, actually 35 years, 35, and um, that's all right. I, um, I got into real estate when I was 30, and um, before that I'd been a secretary for a number of years, and uh, this was a, it was a great change. The um, and I got into it. I didn't. I didn't know what I was getting into. Interest rates were approaching eighteen oh, percent, wow. and I didn't know any better. So it's like, well, okay, that's what it is. And um, and and I survived. I I I don't think I'll ever make as much money as a lot of my. Um, in fact, I know I'll never make as much money as a lot of people in the business. But I think, and I should knock on something. I guess glass here. Um, I don't think I have many enemies, and that's that's rewarding to me. I love mm -hmm. selling someone their first home, particularly if it's in this neighborhood, and I can give a little history that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. What do you love about selling the first home? What excites you? Well, it's the people excite me because they're so excited. You know, buying your first house is is a huge step, and uh, especially if they're young, it's a huge step into adulthood. Um, and they have a lot to learn, and if I don't know the answers, I know how to help them get the answers. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's just very rewarding, and you hope that you, at that point, that you're trusted enough to be able to count on them as lifelong customers. Uh, have you seen a lot of your clients buy second and yes. third homes in yeah. the village? Yes, I have, and, and it's very rewarding when they refer me to, s to some of their friends or family. It's a great business. Oh, well, good. And with 35 years in the business here in German Village, it certainly has changed over time from 18 and, 18 and a half percent, did you say? Oh, yeah. I guess it doesn't matter at 18 percent. Yeah, it really, once it's up there, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. That's when we first um, coined the term creative financing, because there was a lot of owner financing. That's how I bought my house, actually, from the owner um, directly. and. Uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of creative ways that people were able to avoid that eighteen percent. But in the housing market, has certainly changed over time. It certainly has. The last five or six years, it was slow all over, and starting at the middle of last year, things started easing up a bit, and now we are we're so busy and. We're really looking for inventory. It's everything is selling. You know that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the um, when you th think about these cycles of being slow and then being really busy, uh, uh, you've noticed that over the thirty-five years. Oh gosh, well. yeah. <clears throat> and what about the the um, properties that you've been selling? What what have you noticed that's changed? Oh, about well, that? particularly in German Village. And I'm not very good at numbers or percentages, but the, the values, of course, because of what's gone on in the neighborhood, have really skyrocketed. And I think we have found that the values have held, unlike some of the suburbs where maybe in the past five or six years, things people might have lost a little money when they sold. But in German Village, in general, I think the, the values have held up really quite well. Good. Um, so I know uh, you were. You said that you're very excited to work with new first-time buyers, mm -hmm. and that um, <coughs> that <coughs> there's just an energy there that yeah. it's very exciting for you, and um, that you refer them to the German Village Society to get connected. Um, what are the other things that you let them know when you are in the process of selling somebody a home about German Village? Well, I love to take them to the office to see the film. Which of course has changed over the years, and and the, the late the, to the, German the village sure the the history center. that is shown yeah. in the visitor center. Um, I always fill them in about the commission, and try to 
differentiate between the society and the commission so they know what they're dealing with and there are no surprises when they go to make changes on the outside of their house. Make sure that they know that it has to be approved. Um, and I try to get them involved in the social aspect. And meet your neighbors, go out and, and uh, volunteer, get involved. What are some of the opportunities that you share with them? Well, of course, of course, house and garden tour. I always try to recruit people for the German Village Singers. That's um, the first thing I ask is, do you sing? And people say, yes, but only in the shower, or <laughs> no. And if they don't want to sing with us, I say, well, good. We need people to buy tickets, too. So we always have a uh, full house. Um, there's uh, a group of people that get together in the wintertime to play trivia at the 185 Club. And uh, I always encourage people to check that one out. Um, there's a garden club, of course, where um, young people are always invited. And I always say, this is not your grandmother's garden club. So whatever, you know, there's something, there's something for everyone uh, depending on their interests. Mm -hmm. And as um, a member of the Village Singers, I wonder if we can go back to that. Mm -hmm. and if you want to just talk a little bit about how it got started and uh, how, how you've seen changes over the time. Well, John Carter and Mary Kay Beale Carter began the group about 10 years ago. And they just started out by calling a few folks they knew liked to sing. I forgot now how big the group was in the beginning, probably around 20. Mm -hmm. And we're now up to 35 or 40. And it's people who like to sing. It's not too, not too serious. We have a grand old time. Um, we do two performances each year, one at holiday time and one in the spring, usually on Mother's Day. And um, it's almost always sold out. It's good fun. Mm -hmm. And what kinds of things do you do you sing? Who comes up with the program? Well, um, the program is determined by Carla, who is our director now, and she's terrific. She's uh, really high energy. Um, holiday time, of course, is pretty much a given. We do the first half of the show is typically the the more um, religious, sacred, traditional kind of Christmas music. And then in the second half, we do um, lighter kinds of things, um, things that are maybe more, more popular music, uh, newly, newly written things, things like Santa Baby and, mm -hmm. and fun stuff. And, and you have a director now? Did you always have a director? We've, John Carter was the director to begin, and mm -hmm. um, we've had several directors. Our director now is Carla and she is really high energy and she told us on um, Sunday night after our or Sunday afternoon after our performance she can hardly wait for the fall season to begin so she'll be back and we have a fantastic um, accompanist his name is Quentin but he goes by Q and he is a uh, graduate student music student he's been with us I believe four years and he's terrific He's uh, he's fun to fun to sing with. Mm -hmm. And how about for yourself? Where, has singing been something you've done your entire life? Or? Well, yeah, my um, my grandmother encouraged us to sing when we were very young. I've I've always been in the church choir. Um, I was in the school choir in Texas, and then when we moved to Columbus in 1965. I was not able to sing in the Upper Arlington Choir because they had tryouts in the spring and I didn't get here till fall. So that that was a year that singing was missing, so I was I think that's one of the reasons I enjoy German Village singers so much. And and we don't take ourselves too seriously. Yeah. Sounds like you have a lot of fun. We do have a lot of fun. <coughs> well good. And that it's really grown over the years. Indeed it has. Mm -hmm. And how about people who are still involved that were involved from the beginning? There's only three of us. Wayne and Willa Owens and me. And uh, Wayne is now kind of the business manager and as I so often am, I'm the social manager. <laughs> I, arrange, I arrange our socials and, uh, and, uh, and also costume director. 
So costumes. What yeah. Well, it's pretty easy now. We just pick a color, and usually it's black. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there were years when we um, when we did um, oh, one year I made holiday vests for all the singers. And that was kind of yeah, fun. I think I remember yeah. that concert. Yeah. That was pretty mm -hmm. impressive. Yeah. Since your numbers have grown. Yes. Yes, they have. Uh, <coughs> so the there's, there's three of you that are still in there, people that you've recruited from real estate to come over time and in just getting the word out and having people come. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people will come to a concert and say, gosh, this is fun. I can do this. And, mm -hmm. and so we recruit people that way. But I know from talking to you in the past that it's a lot of work to prepare for these concerts. What kind well, of time do you put in? We, ha we have rehearsals on Monday evenings when the season starts. And they're pretty much limited to an hour and a half, once a week, until it gets to be a week before show week, and then we throw in a couple of extras. And people who are doing solos may put in some extra time with the with the accompanist. Um, like any like any concert, you want it to be as good as possible, but but we don't make ourselves crazy about it. And we always have a nice um, a nice party afterwards, so that's that's good. Yeah, and since you're the social director, you're that's right. <laughs> involved in a that. party a party afterwards, and then we always get together, usually in my garden in August to begin preparing for the fall season. Well, it sounds like a nice um, time period for you then. It is. It's, it's you good. Get a little time off. Yeah, I get a little time off and then after the holiday concert in December we take off until the middle of January before we start again. Um, in your role of s as social director, I know you were involved in the Great Cookie Caper, and I wonder if you could tell us about that and a little of its history. Um, I'm trying to think who thought of that one, and it was probably Fred also. Um, but but I remember, I, maybe, well, maybe it was me. Um, I remember seeing in a, I think it was a Midwest Living magazine, about a group of women who baked cookies in some place in Minnesota, I believe. And they got together, they, they baked cookies and put them in their freezers and then they pulled them out and then they sold them for charity. Um, and I thought, well, gosh, we can do that. And the first cookie caper was held at what was then a mystery bookstore on Whittier Street at 3rd. It's now a beauty salon. And I can't recall the name of the store, but it had something to do with mysteries and um, she specialized in mystery books. So uh, in the talking about it, we said, well, we'll just make it the great cookie caper. And the name stuck even after we moved it to the meeting house. But the, the process stayed the same. We called people and said, would you bake cookies and donate them to German Village? And then we put the word out that we had all these wonderful home baked cookies and people would come and buy them and we sold them by the pound and there were always people waiting in line to get in before we opened the doors because they knew they needed to get there early to get the best cookies but we never had any left over they were always sold and I think we got to a cumulative, a cumulative total of money over the years that I ran it and I think we got to maybe ten thousand dollars and I said, okay, that's enough. Somebody else can take it over. And I don't think anybody ever picked it up again. But that's a lot of money just from selling cookies. So Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And it, was it always at the holiday time of year? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, With the great. theory that people would buy cookies and give them as gifts to their friends, but I think people mostly ate them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I sort of on the maybe not as social side of things um, in your commitment to community I know that you were on the board of trustees for some time um, Now maybe that's wrong to assume that it wasn't a social um, event but <laughs> because I'm sure some of the board meetings well, were but some of them were a bit contentious too <laughs> and I suppose they probably still are although I haven't been to one for a while um, yes I was on the board for I believe three terms and I was the secretary and I took the minutes first in shorthand and then transcribed them and then 
I recorded them and transcribed them. And I can't tell you how many hours I would have spent at the typewriter doing that. But, uh, but you listened to the meeting once when you were there, and then again when you uh, transcribed the minutes. So, um, but it was fun. I, I always enjoyed it and, and uh, felt like maybe I was making a little bit of a difference. Mm -hmm. And so, um, about what time was it when you were involved with the meeting? Well, let's see. I was, oh, I don't remember. I had to be in my 30s. So it was a while ago. Mm -hmm. So when you were new, yeah, to yeah, yeah, fairly new. I mean, maybe. Well, I know we were in the. It was before we moved to the new building, okay. the Third Street building. We were in the, the, office on Columbus Street, okay. the the old building. And that's where the meetings were. Um, and how how large was the board at that time? I don't remember, but probably somewhere around twelve. Okay. I I don't recall exactly. And as secretary, what other responsibilities did you have? Oh, just the minutes. Just the minutes. Just the minutes. All those minutes. So you didn't have to do the agendas. And no, we we really didn't have much of an agenda. Okay. I mean, not not the way it is now that a, an agenda is published. I mean, everyone always has their own agenda, but uh, <laughs> and there were some meetings which were a bit contentious, but uh, but mostly it's a pretty congenial group. Mm -hmm. What did you enjoy about being on the board? I like kind of knowing what's going on. Um, maybe having a little bit of an inside track into something that was that was happening, um, you know, yet to be announced. It was always fun. Mm -hmm. And the people. You know, that's what I've always liked about the neighborhood. Yeah, so the, make the characters. The characters. Who are some of the characters that you're thinking about? Oh, let's see. Happen? Well, Fred, of course, was on the board for a long time. Um, Jim Barnes was on the board. Um, Damon Baker was on the board. Um, let's see. Um, trying to think of all the others. Um, Dorothy was on the board for years. Dorothy Fisher. Um, oh gosh, I need to go back to the to the old uh, um, rosters and. And remember people. It's, they, it's been a long time. Mm -hmm. um, over the years, I know you talked about a little bit about the changes in the neighborhood as far as the housing and things are concerned. What would you say about the makeup of the community you now over time? It's very similar now to the, the way it was then because we were all a whole lot younger. And now there's a lot of younger people. Although, you know, a lot of us have stayed on, so there's a, there's a good mix of ages. Um, it's still a very diverse community. I think the thing that I miss most is that I don't think the younger folks are as involved on the volunteer level. So I always try when I have younger clients to get them involved and, and say, it's, you know, it's really rewarding. You'll meet wonderful people. You won't regret it. Mm -hmm. So, what, what's that? Your favorite thing about German Village? What's my favorite thing about German Village? If there's a favorite thing. Well, it's just it's the lifestyle. It's um, it's the fact that uh, you always see people you know when you're walking down the street. You, you can walk into just about any shop or restaurant and know that there's going to be somebody there you know. Um, it's just, it's a very friendly, diverse community, and um, I love it. I'm not going anywhere. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I didn't plan it this way, but I figured out in the last few number of years that uh, the stairway in my house is wide enough that I can put in one of those little chair lifts when I finally need it, <laughs> and just take my, drive myself up to bed when I need to. <laughs> yeah. Or you can convert one of your living rooms. Well, I could do that. <laughs> I could do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Well, it sounds like you're very, very attached to the community and in, in many different ways you've contributed over the years um, with, with different types of involvement. Um, kind of a mover and shaker getting things going and um, 
I don't know that I'm a mover and shaker getting things going, but I can always, if somebody else has the idea, I can usually figure out a way to run with it. Well, I mean, I think you've had, for a, that reason. had a lot of accomplishments and... Well, it's been um, fun. And, getting, and that it also sounds like people are very important to you and that there's, um, it's been a wonderful experience for you to be able to, Absolutely. to live and work in the same place. Absolutely. And, um, I love the people I work with. We have a, a great organization here. Um, the, the friends I made over the years are just like family. My family now lives in Texas, and so we sort of create our own little family here. Mm -hmm. Good. Was there anything else that you'd like to, to add before we end? I can't think of anything. Um, I, I'm best if, if I'm asked a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for taking your time. To thank you. Us.